Hi, everybody here at Backstage. What's going on? I don't know. I tend to sing my greetings when I come on anything live. It's just like a natural thing that I do. Um, but hi. Hello. How is everyone? How are you feeling? Are you feeling? Where are you? Type in the chat. Let me know where you're joining in from, how uh, you're feeling today. I'm so excited to be back. I have not been here at Backstage in a while. It's been about six weeks. And for those of you that don't know me, hi, I'm Brett Shuford, Broadway actor and the Broadway life coach. You might have seen me in Broadway's Wicked, Beauty and the Beast, The Little Mermaid. I've also been in major motion pictures like The Wolf of Wall Street. And I've done television and film work as well in um, independent films and also Law and Order, SVU, The Good Fight, and um, and so I and I've done a lot of commercials. So for those of you who don't know, I'm an actor, and I also work as the Broadway life coach. I love to help actors navigate uh, their reputation. How do you build a reputation in person and digitally online? And um, there's a lot more ways than we think we can do that. And I love to help empower you to find those ways. And that's why I'm here. I'm just gonna say um, hello to those of you coming in. California, Canada, Toronto, hello. I definitely learned being on tour, not to say Toronto, it's Toronto. Um, hi, New York, what's up New York? Last time I think I checked in with you guys, I might've been in Pittsburgh and I'm currently in Houston. So what's up Atlanta, what's up LA? All right, Brett with one T. Yes, I never meet a Brett with one T. So hi, Brett. Nice to meet you. What's up in Atlanta? Like I said, I'm in Houston. I've currently been here for about a month. I'm here for the season. And, and I actually, interestingly enough, just got an agent here, which might be the, my next live, how to get an agent in, a, in another market. Um, so as I said, I've had all of these Broadway credits. And I... Uh, but I, I also have always been very driven to do and create my own work. So I've made a lot of viral YouTube videos, um, if you haven't followed my YouTube channel. And I love producing, creating work. I'm also a director. I've directed musicals and um, stage productions and, and video as well. But one of the things I really found helpful that for, for PR reasons and for creative satisfaction was creating my own solo show. In 2015, I think it was, maybe it was 14, um, I created a show called Charming, A Tale of, of an American Prince. Now, when I say solo show, I'm specifically gonna talk about a musical cabaret type show, but the same rules apply for people who maybe wanna do a solo show that doesn't require music. Um, so there's a, there's definitely crossover here, but what I experienced was I created a show and when I created that show, I was able to book that show and get press uh, around the country. I performed it in New York, of course. I performed it in Orlando. I performed it in Anaheim and Laguna Beach and in uh, downtown LA. I performed it in Houston. I actually ended up getting booked to perform my solo show on a Disney cruise ship uh, two years ago. So this sh creating a solo show may feel daunting for you and I'm, and hopefully today by giving you four steps to create, a, to create your own show, I'll help you break it down so it doesn't feel quite as daunting. But the reason why I think it's important to talk about this now is that for, for anyone who's a live performer, um, anyone who's a live performer, right now theaters aren't going to be bringing in huge massive casts it's just too dangerous right it's too dangerous uh, of a risk for them and um and it's going to be a lot more easier than for them financially to produce or create uh, experiences for their audience that are smaller casts and so you could do a huge favor for theaters if you're in a, a lot of you are saying hello in a smaller market you could do a huge favor to the theaters in your area 
by offering to do your show. Now, we'll get into like the business side of that. That means that you probably wouldn't make a full week salary. You would probably do one night of performing. But so I want you to just have that in, in your mind. But if you could do several one night performances, it would be a concert. It wouldn't be under equity jurisdiction in that way. Um, so there's a lot of business stuff that goes along with that. But uh, it's a great time right now when we're all still sort of in quarantine, there's not a lot of auditioning happening, to take that idea, which I have a feeling you've all had an idea, and really start to put pen to paper to make it happen. So what I would suggest step number one is literally just make a list make a list so if it's a musical for me I, I love to sing so i would choose a musical version make a song list Write down 17 to 24 songs that you love to sing now as you write this list i want you to think about songs you love to sing not necessarily songs that you sing at auditions and songs that you uh, that you feel like audiences would love, but songs that you love to sing, the songs that light you up. If you're wanting to create a show that is not a musical, create an outline. What are the stories that you want to tell? Let go of how they're connected or if they, how you think they're supposed to be connected or if you think they're supposed to tell you. Let go of any of that and just make a list. We're going to make an outline. These are the stories that I think are relevant um, that would be entertaining. Uh, we all have told stories over the years that even if right now they're not connected in your head, they're stories that you love to tell. How can you put them into uh, an outline? So literally it just starts with a list, okay? Step number two, and you're gonna, I don't want your head to explode. You're gonna pick a date. So you got the list and then step number two, you pick a date and that might even mean a date that you perform this for someone or a group of people. So I, once you have that list, you need to have a deadline because if you don't give yourself a deadline and create a sense of urgency, you're not going to do it. Let's be honest. When we have to self-motivate and we don't have accountability, it's going to be a lot harder to complete this. So pick a date. Call someone you love, call someone that uh, a theater you've worked at in the past, uh, a venue you've performed for, or even someone who's hosting virtual events online that you love and, and, and have a great strong relationship with and say, hey, is there a time in October? Is there a time in November uh, that you could put me down for my show? Yeah. Once you have that date, then then you can start to sort of like lighting the, the ignition on the dyno or the, what is the fuse, right? We're lighting the fuse. Now, that means that even if you have a date on the calendar and you only have an outline, your show isn't done and that's okay. Because here's the thing I learned when I performed my show. The show is never done. When it's your own show, especially a solo show, you're always gonna be making adjustments. Even when you're performing it live, sometimes an audience isn't gonna react, every audience isn't the same, is it gonna react the same way. So knowing that it's gonna be always be a work in progress should give you a sense of relief to just continue to move forward and not let perfectionism be the enemy of good. I talk a lot about perfectionism and the mindset and, and what we need to do to continue to pursue this business, especially during this time. I talk a lot about that in my free Facebook group. So if you guys want to join that group, it's the Broadway Life Coach group on Facebook. Come join the conversation. Um, I want to help support as many people during this time as possible. And that's the way that I'm doing that. So we talk about this mindset, this idea of perfectionism, whatever our concept is, whatever we think perfectionism is. And, on, and knowing that when we get caught up in perfectionism, we're actually just preventing us from getting it done because the thing is it will never be perfect. That's what makes us human. That's why people love live performance 
because they're witnessing human beings and human beings are innately not perfect. If people want to see perfect, they would watch robots <laughs> and you're not a robot. Allow people to allow yourself to let people vulnerably see who you are as a performer. And there's nothing more vulnerable and empowering than doing your own show and telling your own story. All right. So you've got your outline. You've got your date. The third thing you want to do is now go through that outline or that list of songs and notice any themes. And when I say themes, like what are the general values of those songs and those stories? And are there any connections? For me, when I created my first show, I was thinking how much I love Disney. I just love Disney. And I thought, um, so I have a lot of Disney songs I had, uh, and then I started thinking about princesses. Disney princesses get lunch boxes. Disney princesses get uh, t-shirts. Where are the princes? There's no, where are the Disney princes, right? Besides some Instagram fan sites, there's no, they, when, do, when do they get their due? And so I noticed I had all these Disney songs, but then I started to notice the, the, uh, where are the princes? Like there was a theme around Disney and princesses and princes. And I was like, Oh, what if I create a show themed on princes? And as I started to, what I, what you'll start to do is you'll start to go, okay, here's the theme. This song doesn't work. You can start to eliminate some of those songs and you can start to think about other songs that might fit into that theme. You're going to sort of re-figure that list. And that might even mean with your stories, this story doesn't really fit in here, but I do have this other story that could, or I could take this story and make it work around this theme, okay? So what I did is I started to go, oh, well, what about Prince, the artist? What about Into the Woods? What about Broadway princes? And I created a, uh, you know, sort of adjusted that song list and maybe even made some of those songs that I thought I needed to eliminate and put them into a medley. These three songs could work together in one unit, right? And do sort of a mashup. And so once I had kind of an idea of the theme, uh, all this list, that's step number three. Step number four is to then get a director or a music director, right? Get an outside source to help you complete it. So the reason I suggest this is, is multi-layered. One thing, you're, it's going to be too close to you and uh, for you to see the, wh where the story needs to be. Okay, so having someone who's got experience as a director uh, or a music director, I think if you're doing a musical show, I think a music director is the first, is the next step because that person, you can sing through the music, you can see how it feels, you can see what how to construct that. But getting an outside point of view is going to help you. The other thing that does, and I want you to think about if you're hiring or, or you, know, you will spend a little money on this, right? You want to invest a little bit if you can, to have someone help you even just on occasion, because having an outside perspective can help you thread the songs, thread the stories and put them together in a, in a sequential order. The other thing this does is if you have a director or someone who's connected to other theaters and other um, who have experience, right? Those, they can also help get you into other venues and get you visibility. So you'll want to get someone that you trust and love and, and also that can up level you a little bit, right? Our tendency is to want to hire people or bring people in that make us feel safe, but we want to maybe bring someone in who's going to challenge us and push us out of our comfort zone a little bit. Um, and that can be very vulnerable and very scary, but that's how you grow, right? If you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. So getting someone who can help push you out of your comfort zone to help solidify and maybe even connect you to other venues, because that is such a great, powerful way to collaborate, create a, build a network. And, and that network is now centered over your craft and what it is you do. So 
once those are the four first steps I think you need to do to be able to start to get your solo show just started. Once you've got that date, you've got a director. And again, then you're going to want to perform it. You're going to want to perform it and see what works and what doesn't work. The first time you do the show, you're going to know, whoa, that didn't work. That didn't, that did work. And then you can adjust it accordingly and then put, but what I will tell you is that once you perform that show, you have such a renowned, like a, a renewed sense of confidence. You're going to want to do it again. You're going to want to have more dates down the line to continue to, to create that show. So those are my four first steps that I think are important to get started on creating your solo show. There's a lot of other stuff around marketing, which um, and and promoting and getting press that that's like a whole next level. But we want to get back to the show. So if you've had, I'd, I'd love to open it up for Q and A. But if you had it in the back of your head for a while to create a show, I think now is the best time. Let me know uh, if you have specific questions for me, and they don't have to be related to the show. Um, but I'm going to open up for Q&A and see how I can support you guys. Okay. Great. Bible groove sessions, constructive criticism. That's right. Having an outside point of view, understanding you. Great. Brett, what goes on in your head when you know the show isn't going where you want it to? How do you overcome the internal battle? Um, I, I'm assuming, Brett, you mean when you're actually performing it? Um, Typically, you know, the critic, the critic will always be there, right? We all have that little critic in our head. If the show isn't going where you want it to, I always, I always fall into the, uh, it's better to just state the obvious. So I will always say something to the effect because the, because when you're performing your show, your audience really is, you're in a relationship with them. So I will, uh, I will say things like, and this, I'm not saying this has ever really happened, but I'm of the, the ilk that I would say, whoa, that joke landed so much better in rehearsal. <laughs> Just state the obvious. Like, oh, this is not what I expected to have happen in this moment. Just saying it can help people connect to you as opposed to trying to pretend like, oh, this isn't going the way I want. We want to let people really see who you are and so really stating the obvious is a great way. I also had a moment, I remember, where I went up on a song on the lyrics and then um, I just stopped and said, whoa, can I do that again? And the audience was like, whoa, right? They're there, they're there on your side, right? The audience wants you to do well. So remembering that they're on the journey, they're taking that journey with you and if you have a good director and a good music director with you, they're, they're, you're not alone. They're there to help you make that and navigate it. Great. What pieces do you use to create a show? I'm not sure what you mean. What pieces do you use to create a show? What do you mean by pieces? If you can clarify that. I have some stuff in file for a solo artist and multi of us. Cool. Um, what are the best ways to monetize your own show? Great suggestion. So one of the best ways is Patreon. For If you're doing it virtually, patreon.com is an awesome website to, uh, you can basically creates a paywall for you. So if people want to come see the show, they have to become a donor. And if you want to do, the, do a re repetitive show, if you're creating content in any way, uh, Patreon great for you to get people subscribing to that. Uh, I also, tickets, you can sell tickets through any ticket website. And what you could do is if you're doing it virtually, you can um, sell tickets and set up an automated email sequence where, and this is through, um, who am I thinking of? The ticket service that I know most of is pa brown paper tickets. And when they get their confirmation, there's the Zoom link for the live call. So you can sell it that way. Um, that to me would be the, the best way to go if you're doing it virtually. 
Now online, I have done things where I've done fundraisers, I've done giveaways. So I would give away a CD or I would give away merch or I would do, um, you know, some sort of for, for people who donated the first 25 people who donate to my Patreon or uh, the pe first five people who donate to this, I, you get these prizes and these rewards, things like that. That is a great way. Eventbrite is a great ticketing site as well. What you want to make sure, Joe Johannes, is you want to make sure you're looking at what percentage they take. But I would honestly consider doing something like that over PayPal or Venmo because they create automated systems for you to be able to really connect with them, okay? Um, yeah, be you. Just let me know what you mean by pieces because I want to make sure I get to your question. How to act realistically. Can you give tips about this? Well, yeah, Rania, acting realistically is just pretending, right? Uh, acting is not real. It's interesting. I have an acting teacher used to say, there's nothing natural about acting. <laughs> pretending to be in a situation where people are watching you, this is not natural. So really allowing yourself to know that and acknowledge that like this is, it's going to feel awkward to be an actor because there's cameras and there's people watching you. So acting realistically is really about always giving yourself true action, pretending you're in the actual situation that that character is in. So what is that situation playing that for real? Um, so I think that it's really about engaging your imagination. I think it takes practice. You need to be in a class. You need to be training if that's what you want to be doing. During these COVID times, what is your favorite at-home setup? Microphones, cameras, lights, mixers. That's super. I actually have a course called Musical Theater Self Tapes um, that I break all that down. So it's it's a kind of a big question, uh, which is why I, I, I built a whole course around it. But the... My favorite at-home setup, I like to use a lavalier mic. I know some people don't like a lav mic because it takes you out of the scene, but I think it sounds better. And I also feel like most casting directors use a lav mic, but I do shoot on my iPhone. I use my um, iPhone 11. I have uh, this great shotgun mic that fits on my iPhone. It's a Shure MV88. And I will try to get as much natural light as I can. But if I can't, I use the three-point lighting setup. So if you don't know what a three-point lighting setup is, you can Google it. Super easy to figure out. That's my favorite setup. And, uh, and then I edit on Final Cut Pro. What's the best thing to do during this pandemic? Resting or staying busy, Sindoro? Great question. There is no right or wrong thing to do during this pandemic. I think that it's really about balance. This moment is really about balance, resting and um, staying not, I wouldn't say busy, but staying active, taking small steps towards what it is you want and not necessarily what you want in the business, but who you want to be as a person. And that means balance. That means when you start to feel overwhelmed, which we're all experiencing, uh, especially as November approaches, we need to be uh, taking advantage of scheduling time off scheduling days off where you can rest and recharge and refill your, your spirit or whatever you want to call it. Oh, Brett, great. I'm glad that helped. Um, what's the best thing to do during this pandemic? Yeah. So I would say you want to find a balance. Rania, great question. How is your met? What is your method to memorizing a script? My method is old school repetition. Repetition, repetition, repetition. It's not the most fun, but the, the more you read it out loud and maybe even have someone help you, the quicker I find for me it helps to memorize. Also, 
letting go of perfection, right? We come back to this theme of letting perfectionism be the enemy of good. A lot of times, especially in an audition, they're not going to be that critical of you saying the lines verbatim, right? it depends on how much time you've had. You want to be prepared as prepared as you can be, because there's always going to be somebody more prepared than you, but you want to let go of any perfectionism that you might have around getting every single word, right? Brett, come join me um, in my free Facebook group, broadwaylifecoach.com. Um, techniques for performance anxiety. Oh, good. So tips, oh, sorry, yeah, Sindoro is part of the, uh, my Secure Actor Project, which is also free. So secureactorproject.com, you can enroll and it's totally free. And that's a great way to learn about everything we have going on over in there. Okay, so techniques for performance anxiety. Sure, so I am a huge believer in writing, journaling. If you could see my desk, I have like five notebooks if I don't take what's going on up here, and this is hopefully true for you as well, and get it out of my head, it will live in here and it will fog up everything I'm trying to do. So step number one is get all of the junk that's clogging up your brain and your creative flow and your, your desire to do well, which is you know, typically not great things that are being said in your head, and get it down on paper so that it no longer lives in here. It has a like physical manifestation. So step number one, journal. And it doesn't have to be like, I'm journaling, I'm doing a diary every day. Just stream of conscious. Okay, these are the thoughts that are happening. Get out of your head so you can get really clear about what it is you do want, okay? That's step number one. And step number two is a mantra. Come up with a mantra, something that is gonna help you feel secure in the moment. Because typically if we're having anxiety or fear, we're thinking about something that might've happened in the past. So we're living in regret, or we're thinking about something that could potentially happen in the future. So we're living in fear, right? And I say fear is false evidence appearing real. If it's in the future, it hasn't happened, it doesn't exist. So if we can let go of our expectations or regret and our expectations of the future and get ourselves centered in the moment, that's where we can find a mantra. So sometimes the mantra could be, I have everything I need in this moment. Sometimes the mantra can be, I deserve happiness. I deserve to do well, right? Sometimes it's, I'm letting go of my perfection and, and being a human being, right? Whatever that is. And you want to repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it until you go into the audition room or on stage. And uh, your, your, your mind is a computer. And if we don't program our computer, it's gonna program itself and it's not always gonna program it the right way. So you have to program it and that takes repetition, that takes writing it down, and that takes creating a mantra so you start to reprogram your brain. Um, okay, Dav, I'm at a speed bump to do what you're suggesting from what I used to do before COVID. I'm a singer. I play guitar about 165 gigs a year at pubs, bars, festivals, corporate events, etc. I also do VOs. How do I turn it into a show? Yeah, great question. So like I said, Dav, I would start with a list of songs, a list of your 14 to 24 of your favorite songs you like to perform. Again, I think it helps to see it written down. Start there. Give yourself a deadline. I'm going to perform this show on this date. And then you're going to get someone to help you. Someone who has more experience putting on a more of a linear type of show, something that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and have them come in and help you get that together. Um, and I think that would be the best way to go. You're going to get back to work. We're all going to get back to work. So you might as well continue to create your own work during this time. Face everything and rise. That's right. Oh, I like that. Instead of false evidence appearing real, that's good. What is your method to avoid fear before the scene? Hmm. 
what is your method to avoid fear before the scene? Well, you can't always avoid fear. It's not necessarily about avoiding fear. It's about acknowledging the fear. See, what we put our focus on and what we resist, you've probably heard this before, what we resist persists. So if we start to say, I'm supposed to avoid fear, I'm not supposed to be afraid, I'm not supposed to be nervous, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna get more fear, more nervousness. So my suggestion is to go, okay, I'm acknowledging this. I acknowledge that I'm feeling afraid or I'm feeling anxious in this moment. And say, okay, I hear it, I feel it. Where is it in your body? Where is it coming up for you? And instead of saying, go away, say, I, I feel you, man. I'm scared. This is scary. What we're about to do is nerve wracking, but we got this. I got this. Right? Tell the fear. Instead of go away, say, let's do this together. We can get this together. You almost want to make it an external part of who you are and have a conversation with it. It might feel totally cheesy, but to acknowledge that anxiety and say, hey, we're going to do great if you let me drive instead of you driving the car. Mantras are great. Confidence in your ability, I guess. Oh, I see. Um, so I always say confidence is not necessarily the absence of our imperfections or our faults, but the acceptance of our faults. The people you know or consider confident are confident because they know exactly what makes them tick and what doesn't work for them. And they own that and they don't allow themselves to be in regret or shame or fear that it's not enough. So where are you judging yourself where are you, you know, where are you focusing on the things you can't control versus the things you can control? Now, most of the time I find if I'm nervous before an audition, perhaps I didn't prepare enough. That's something I can control. I can memorize more. I can work more on my craft. We will always want to work more on our craft. But if you're nervous because that one time when you were eight years old, somebody tripped you and you fell on stage and you made a ass of yourself, <laughs> then you can let that go because that's not happening today. That's not happening in this moment. So really looking at what are the things you can control versus the thing you can't control. Mental exercise. I understand you coach. I possibly confront y'all when I, whatever I have wrote, et cetera, same team. Cool. Yes. These are great questions, you guys. I love to talk about the mental aspect of approaching this business. It is a mental game. And right now is a great time to be practicing how you're going to mentally do that. We can always figure out the how. There's always going to be new, re new ways to discover how to build a business. But if we don't know why we're doing it, it's going to be really hard to be satisfied when we get there. All right, Sindoro wants to know, how do you deal with rejection? Well, rejection, first off, is just uh, a judgment. So when I'm thinking about auditions, like if we're talking about auditions, um, not getting a job can be frustrating because I want to book the job and I want to work on a show, especially if it's something I really want to do that'd be really cool. And that's happened a lot, but I don't see it as rejection because the people I met in the room are people that I'm making a connection with. I'm building a network. You know, it doesn't matter if I didn't get the job. If I did a great job in the room, they're going to remember me and we'll stay in touch through social media or whatever. And those relationships are going to go much further than that job ever would. So knowing that rejection is a judgment, if I'm thinking I got rejected, then I'm thinking and those people don't want to work with me, which I, which just isn't true, right? That's, I don't know that. It's none of my business really what other people think of me. So if I let go of my judgment about what I think that they're thinking and I just go, wow, I left everything I could in that room. 
And those people, I could tell they liked me and it just wasn't the right project for me and there'll be something else in the future. And then the rejection goes away. I hope that answered your question. Cool. All right. So if no one has any other questions, I just want to uh, wrap up and say thank you. Please come join the Secure Actor Project at secureactorproject.com. We uh, took a break this month, but we are picking back up in October with some exciting new guests and some exciting uh, new events happening in that group. I will be back here on Backstage Live in October. Always reach out to me on Instagram, social media, uh, and let me know how I can support you during this time because that is my mission to always be here for my community and you are a part of my community, this great community that we have here at Backstage as well. I'm honored to be a part of the Backstage expert team and thank you all for joining me today. Grateful for you, grateful for a, another Brett with one T and um, I will see you all soon. Be safe and vote. Bye.